I'm, don't misunderstand me when, when I give this talk. I'm not really talking about uh, that these attacks are getting more well-developed, more complex, anything like that. The, the sad thing is, is with, with the internet, we're, we're confusing access to more information. We're confusing that with being more knowledgeable. And, um, and uh, with the internet, all sources seem to be, we think they're created equal. And so a guy starts his own website and has as much, much credibility as Dr. D. Young, you know, to the, to the guy on the internet. It's just like you, just, you have no way of knowing who's who. So, um, so apparently we're dealing with a, a historically illiterate American populace. And um, we're also confusing his, history deals with probabilities and it, it's all based on whether or not your sources are early and are reliable. If you have reliable early sources that sh and, and lots of these sources, that should say something. I mean, it is rather interesting if Jesus was just a carpenter from Nazareth, why there's 42 different authors who mention him within 150 years of his death. Um, Caesar Tiberius, the emperor of his day, there's only 10 authors that mention him within 150 years of, uh, that we know of, of, of his death. So, um, so there, we've got some really good, early, reliable material, okay? Um, but we have a lot of people now that think if something is logically possible, then it's okay for me to hold, to choose, pick and choose, that's what I want to believe. So. A guy at USC gets his doctoral dissertation uh, speculating that maybe Jesus had a twin brother that he never told the apostles about. And after Jesus was crucified, his twin brother coincidentally showed up. <laughs> they thought he was Jesus. He was kind of digging the worship and said, hey, this is okay. I can, I can live with this for 40 days. And then he got bored and left. And so they figured, well, he must have went back to heaven. Uh, um, Logically possible, yeah, I mean, it's logically possible that you don't exist and I'm just dreaming that you're here, but I'd be an ignoramus if I believed that. And so uh, we're confusing historical probability and having reliable early sources, which is good historical evidence, with, well, if it's possible, I'm free to believe this. And, and this is what we're facing right now. Now, I'm going to deal with four different people here one of them is not a scholar. The other three are legitimate scholars. Now, because they're legitimate scholars, it doesn't mean that the conclusions they draw are widely accepted by other scholars. In fact, I would argue that all three of the scholars, their opinions are not widely accepted by other scholars. Um, at least the conclusions, the conclusions that they draw. Some of their premises, yeah, they would be the Jesus Seminar, far left New Testament scholars would agree. But Dan Brown is just a novelist, and he doesn't claim to be a scholar or anything. But the big problem with his book, The Da Vinci Code, is on that first page where it says fact in bold letters. And then he claims that the historical background for his novel is really accurate. And then he gives this big conspiracy theory of the history of Christianity. Um, so he's not a scholar, and you're not going to find other scholars holding to his view. However, on the Internet, even views that are not real scholarly uh, often become uh, popular. Now, we're not going to deal with his, uh, you know, Jesus was m married to Mary Magdalene, and she had to flee because Peter was a male chauvinist pig after Jesus died. So then she fled to France and gave birth to Sarah, Jesus' daughter, and then she intermarried with the secret royal line of the French and all this other stuff. Uh, nobody, nobody of any credibility ex accepts that. So we just want to deal with, uh, and, and uh, by the way, you can go to my website, instituteofbibeldefense.com, and I gave three, like, for, for, for like four or five years, all I got asked to speak on was the Da Vinci Code. I was so tired of, of, of doing that. But, but you can listen to uh, three different talks, three-part series on it, and I deal with all the little bogus things and the symbols and, and things of that sort. All I want to talk, by the way, he's, He's got a nice smile, doesn't he? Real nice guy. All right, whatever. Okay, um, um, but as his book, the Da Vinci Code, and, um, 
And what I want to deal with is Dan Brown's attack on the historical Jesus where he said that Jesus was not considered to be God by the church until 325 A.D. at the Council of Nicaea. Now, when I, when I debated atheist philosophy professor Doug Kruger at uh, SUNY, the State University of New York at the Oswego, it's either Oswego or Oswego campus up in up, upstate New York, um, one of their biology professors came up and said, isn't it true that uh, Jesus was made God in 300 A.D. and before that nobody believed that? And I said, no, that's nonsense. We got the writings of church fathers that go all the way back to 96 A.D., attributing deity to Jesus. Then you got ancient creeds that go back even further. And, and so he figured, well, that's, he's the Christian guy, so he's going to say that. And then Doug Kruger, who's arguing against the resurrection on that night, said, yeah, he's right. And the biology professor said, he's right. And he said, yeah, he's right. Uh, Christians believe that Jesus was God way before 325 A.D. In fact, even the Jesus Seminar, the far-left Jesus Seminar, acknowledges that when Paul started writing his letters about 49 or 50 A.D., they accept seven of Paul's letters as authentic. Uh, virtually all New Testament scholars, probably 97 to 99%, are going to accept Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Philippians, Philemon, and 1st Thessalonians as authentically Pauline letters written between 50 and about 64 A.D., Okay, and they acknowledge Paul from when he began to write already acknowledged Jesus was God incarnate and uh, in some sense risen from the dead. And they'll try to debate about whether that was a physical resurrection or not. And I think you can make a case, a very strong case, that Paul taught the physical resurrection. So D Doug Kruger knew this, and so he's arguing for Jesus being a legend within 20 years from his supposed death, which is, you know, good luck, Dougie. But um, whatever the case, uh, so even a biology teacher, it's kind of, it's, it's outside of his field of expertise, um, can fall for something like this, okay? Um, but the, the problem is that Dan Brown is, is ignorant uh, of the history of Christian thought. Everyone at the Council of Nicaea already believed Jesus was divine in some sense, and the creator of the world. See, the debate was not, hey, let's, should we turn Jesus into a god or not? I mean, we've been just treating him as a man up to this point for the last 300 years. Should we make him a god or not? That had not, nothing to do with it. Both sides said, hey, he created the universe. The question was, was uh, Arius right? Was he a lesser god? The first thing that God created, and then Jesus created everything else? Uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses are the modern-day Arians today. Or is Jesus one in being with the Father? Uh, how many people, I look around this crowd, and some of you people are as old as me, and that's good. That makes me feel good about myself. But, um, <laughs> but how many have heard the expression, that, does not make, that doesn't make one iota of difference? Okay? Anybody know where that came from? It came from the Council of Nicaea. Because G, the, the debate was, is Jesus homo usias, one in being with the Father, or is he homoi usias, Greek words, similar in being with the Father? And the only difference is the, the kind of the letter I of the Greek alphabet, the iota, the smallest letter of the Greek alphabet, and all the people made fun of the theologians. Over 300, over 300 of them showed up because they said, those guys will argue all night long and call a big conference and travel clear across the the Roman Empire, um, just to argue about the letter I. Well, the letter I there, the iota, is the difference between the Jehovah's Witnesses and Orthodox Christianity, okay? But basically what I'm saying is nobody went in there thinking Jesus was merely human. So Dan Brown has detached himself from historical reality uh, by making this claim. All the leading church fathers taught that that uh, Jesus was God incarnate from the Apostolic Fathers on. The Apostolic Fathers, they were pretty much the, the pupils of the Apostles who were trained by the Apostles and selected by the Apostles to lead, in the, er to lead the early church. Okay? Some of the Apostolic Fathers may have actually been colleagues of the Apostles. Okay? Uh, Clement of Rome, he was the Bishop of Rome, and he wrote in 95 AD. Now, I doubt a city like Rome, they're not going to say, well, let's just, let's just make... Uh, 
some slouch, the bishop. And, you know, this guy probably was pretty sharp. Paul may even mention him in one of his letters. He mentions a Clement that he knew. And some think that it's Clement of Rome. Uh, but Clement of Rome, you get Polycarp, pupil of the Apostle John. Um, he lived all the way to 156 A.D., but he wrote about uh, 110 A.D. Ignatius wrote seven letters in route. He was the bishop. Ignatius was the uh, bishop of Antioch of Syria, no slouch of a church. That's where Paul and Barnabas, they commissioned Paul and Barnabas to preach the gospel. He had been the bishop there for about 30 years. So he may, before that, he may have known Paul and Barnabas. And over and over again, Ignatius calls Jesus our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So you get all the church fathers from 95 A.D. through 325 A.D., they're all attributing deity to Jesus. This is not something that, that, that was non-existent in the church until 325 A.D., like Dan Brown thinks. Uh, as I mentioned, even, even the far-left Jesus Seminar acknowledges that Paul taught the deity of Christ in his letters by the late 40s A.D. And, and by the way, um, Larry Hurtado of the University of Edinburgh, one of the world's leading New Testament scholars, in his work, The Lord Jesus Christ, a 650-page tome, he says Paul liked to argue. And in his letters, he did a lot of arguing with his readers. And if he didn't argue, that's because he knew his readers just already believed it. So Paul never argues that Jesus is God. He just mentions it in passing, meaning Paul assumed because his readers were Christians, they already believed Jesus is God. So in other words, if Paul starts writing 49 or 50 AD that Jesus is God, that's not something he's arguing for. That's something he's already assuming. So it's had to have been taught even before that. Uh, read the first 11 verses of 1 Corinthians 15. He claimed he was teaching the same gospel that Peter and the other apostles taught from the beginning. So Paul's claiming that the resurrection of Jesus, the post-resurrection experiences, Jesus dying for our sins, and the deity of Christ itself, that this goes right back to the original teaching, uh, teachings of the apostles. And even the far left of New Testament scholarship acknowledges that Paul wrote 1 Corinthians about 55 AD. Marcus Borg and um, Gerd Ludmann, two of the most far left radical New Testament scholars, both deny the bodily resurrection of Jesus, but they, they actually date that creed that Paul quotes, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 8, about the post resurrection appearances of Christ. Uh, they argue that that creed was probably, Paul probably received it about a year after Jesus' crucifixion. So a creed is already made up, giving a summary list of the post-resurrection appearances of Christ and a creed that mentions the gospel message and refers to Jesus as, as Lord. Um, and so these ancient creeds and hymns, even the, the, the uh, ancient creeds and hymns, you also have ancient sermons, the first 12 chapters of the book of Acts. New Testament scholars say, well, this is very primitive in theology. They're just, they're just stating the facts. He was crucified, he uh, uh, died, was buried, he rose. Um, they're not putting a lot of theological interpretation into it other than he's Lord and Savior and Messiah. Um, this has to be real primitive. And so many New Testament scholars acknowledge that the, the sermons of Acts chapters 1 through 12 go back to the early 30s AD as well. So Larry Hurtado concludes that the early church engaged in what he called Binitarian worship, See, they didn't have the Holy Spirit totally figured out yet. They had these statements that Jesus made, and, uh, and Paul, in his Trinitarian formulas, he knew, you know, you got Father, Son, Holy Spirit, but they didn't fully spell out the Trinity. But the early church from the start, they were monotheists, Jewish monotheists, believe there's only one God, and the Father is God, and the Son is God, and they're distinct persons. We need to worship them both, but there's still only one God. So they didn't have the third person fully figured out, but Larry Hurtado argued they would have still been considered just a tribe of Judaism had they not acknowledged the deity of Christ and said prayers to him and sang hymns to him. And so Larry Hurtado says, when did the early church acknowledge Jesus as God, recognize him as God? Uh, it goes back to the early 30s AD. In fact, we actually see that in the Bible. Somebody... His mind is transformed. He kind of loses his faith in Jesus because Jesus is dead. 
And then the apostles say, well, we saw him risen. He said, no, I, I won't believe unless I can touch the, the holes in his hands and his feet and touch his pure side. Um, I just, you know, I put everything into this and now he's dead. I'm not going to believe just because you tell me. I got to see it myself. And then Jesus appears in the upper room and the doors are locked. And Thomas immediately, instead of, instead of touching Jesus' body, Thomas immediately says, my Lord and my God. So when did he realize Jesus was God? When he saw Jesus risen from the dead, and then he remembered all those things that Jesus said, and he said, oh, wow, he wasn't talking figuratively. He really meant I and the Father are one. He really meant before Abraham was born, I am. Okay? So if you want to slam Christianity and say, that, well, the church just pretended Jesus was God, well, you got to go right back to the early 30s A.D., to the inception of Christianity, okay? And, and again, uh, it's amazing how much true New Testament scholars, like even the far left Jesus Seminar, will concede on that particular point. So now let's take a look at Bart Ehrman. Uh, so the only thing wrong with Dan Brown is he's off by 300 years, okay? Other than that, uh, now Bart Ehrman, is a, this, this dude is a legitimate scholar, Okay. By the way, guys like Bart Ehrman write articles refuting Dan Brown's views. Even the Jesus Seminar refutes Dan Brown's stuff. Okay. But Bart Ehrman, he was a Princeton scholar. He worked with Bruce Metzger, who's probably more responsible than anybody else for the Greek New Testament text that most uh, New Testament scholars accept to this day. So if you, buy, if you buy a Greek New Testament text today, more than likely Bruce Metzger's name is going to be all over it. And this guy was like one of his you know, his protege. He even co-authored a work on New Testament studies with uh, Bruce Metzger, the, the great uh, Princeton scholar. But, but I want to deal with his, his work, misquoting Jesus, the story behind who changed the Bible and why. It's really weird. It's a weird subtitle because he really doesn't get into <laughs> that. I don't know why he, he uh, subtitled it that, maybe just to sell books. But whatever the case, what he says is that since the copies of the New Testament have so many variants, we cannot trust the New Testament we have today. Therefore, we don't know what the early church actually taught about Jesus. So he's saying it's a big question mark. Now, right off the bat, you ought to say, if he helped Bruce Metzger to come up with the, the Greek New Testament text, if he's that skeptical, he should have said, I have to resign. I can't do this in good conscience because we don't even know what the, the text would be because there's so many variants. Now, what is a variant? A variant isn't really necessarily a contradiction, though it might be. A variant is if you have two copies, you know, if I, all, if I ask you all to write down something like, uh, Willie McCovey hit 45 home runs in 1969. And if you all wrote it, if, if somebody spelt Willie McCovey's name wrong, that would be a variant. If there's any difference between one copy and another copy, that's a variant, okay? And uh, he said, look, we got so many variants, we can't trust the New Testament we have today, so we have no idea what the early church taught about Jesus, okay? Now, let me say this. He says that there's somewhere between 200,000 and 400,000 variants. That's a lot of variants. That's more than all the words in the New Testament combined, so that sounds pretty bad, Okay? <laughs> It sounds like we're, we're on a, a sinking ship, okay? But what you have to understand, though, is the reason why we have so many variants is because we have so many copies. When you've got over 26,000 handwritten copies, you're going to get a whole lot of different variants, okay? So we just got to look closer at what he's saying here. First off, the first point you need to recognize, the New Testament is by far the most reliable of all ancient writings, because you have more copies, over 26,000. At most, Homer's Iliad only has about 800 now. Josh McDowell in the 70s, it was like 643. Last I heard, there might be as many as 800 now, because that's, you know, it's like 40 years ago when he wrote evidence that demands a verdict. Um, but that's second place, Homer's Iliad, of all ancient writings. Most of the time, you get like, like Plato's writings, you get seven copies, only seven hand, handwritten copies. Um, that were written uh, 1,200 years after the originals were supposedly written. Now, you might say, well, well, wait, there might have been a lot of mistakes and variants within that 1,200 years, and they say, hey, don't worry about it. 
That's good evidence for ancient writings. But then when it comes to the New Testament, oh, we use a different standard for the New Testament. Why? Why use a different standard? You got 5,000, uh, you got more copies, but you also have these copies are much closer to the originals. That 1,200-year gap in Plato's writings is almost non-existent when you get the earliest fragments we have in the New Testament. By, by 200 A.D., uh, we basically have most of the New Testament, every New Testament book and most of the New Testament in the Chester Beatty papyri uh, by about 200 A.D., so just within about the first 100 years. We've got, in fact, in fact, Chester B. Papyri could probably be, be uh, dated uh, closer to 170, 180 A.D. So within 100 years, you've got the complete uh, New Testament. By the way, we don't, have, we don't have originals of anything from the first century A.D., so all we can deal with is the copies. 5,700 Greek copies, 10,000 Latin copies, all total over 25,000, some scholars say over 26,000 handwritten New Testament copies, Almost, then also, almost the entire New Testament is quoted in the early church fathers. You get the early church fathers, the first five or six hundred years after the Bible is completed, you can reproduce the entire New Testament except for 11 verses. Okay? So they tell us, we're, we're quoting this New Testament that Bart Ehrman is going to later on tell you wasn't there or whatever, or is, is open the question. Um, so, I mean, you know... Historians salivate to see evidence like that. And there's been more than one historian that has scratched his head and wonder why New Testament scholars are so critical of the New Testament text when they don't have anything else like it um, from the first century A.D. Um, uh, the older copies might be copies of the originals. Bart Ehrman says we have no uh, third or fourth generation copies. How, do you, how does he know? Well, we've got... We've got fragments that go back to the, the uh, second century A.D. How does he know those fragments? How does he know the Chester Beatty papyri? Uh, that could be a copy of the original. He doesn't know. He's just assuming that. Uh, Tertullian, in, in uh, about 200 A.D., a big wig in the early church said, we, have, we still had the authentic writings in Palestine. Now, he either meant that at that time they still had the originals or verified exact duplicates of the originals. But he was saying this is not called into question, okay? I mean, are we really to believe that Ignatius, when he's quoting Mark's gospel um, in 180 AD, a big bishop like that in the church, probably the biggest gun in the church in, of his time, that he's got lousy copies? So, uh, so ba basically, we look at the, let's look at the type of variations that that uh, Ehrman's talking about. And by the way, every one of these variants that he's talking about, if we Christians, no Christian should be shocked by anything that Bart Ehrman says if we just read the margins in our Bibles or the footnotes. Because all the evangelical Bibles talk about these, these variants, okay? And uh, if you want all of them, uh, they're all mentioned at the bottom of the page uh, underneath the Greek text of the, the, the New Testament Greek text, it'll tell you which, which manuscript copies differ and have a different, uh, a different phrase and things of that sort. So this is not anything that should be hidden from Christians. This is something that is out in the open. Nobody's trying to hide it. And Bart Ehrman's acting like everybody's trying to hide it. Now I'm going to bring it out. I got the courage to bring it out in the open. But most of the, ver most of the variations are just spelling errors. He wrote down... Uh, in 1969, William McCovey had 45 home runs. You spelled his name wrong. We'll be able to compare the other copies and figure out what the proper spelling is. Uh, the movable new is like our letter in the, for the Greek, Koine Greek. It's like our letter N. Okay? If we say, uh, I have a car, but it's N automobile. We add the letter N because automobile starts with a vowel. They do that in the Greek as well. Well, some of the copyists weren't as versed in the Greek as some of the other copyists, and they'd see the movable new, and they'd say, oh, he spelled the word wrong. Let me remove the new. Maybe, and maybe uh, another guy gets a copy that's missing the movable new, and he knows more about the Greek, so he adds the movable new. So just spelling errors, the movable new, that alone explains most of these variants. Now, is it really going to matter when it's translated into English whether the movable new is there or not in a lot of the copies? Uh, or that a word was misspelled 
It's not going to make any difference in the translation. The word order. You realize there's something like, I think, 16 different ways in Koine Greek of saying John loves Jesus. You can say the John loves the Jesus, or the John loves Jesus, or Jesus, John loves. Uh, you can use the different Greek words for love. He phileo loves him, or he agape loves him. Um, and there's like 16 different ways. And guess what? In English, guess what it would be? John loves Jesus. So if it's, if it's a difference of word order in the Greek, it's the word endings that tell you what the subject is, what the object is, and we still translate it the same way. Uh, and then use of the definite article. Uh, there are some times uh, when the, uh, the, the Greek words for the are there, and then in some of the copies they're left out, or vice versa. In English, it's still not going to, it's really not going to change it. So, uh, so what it comes down to is, out of all these variants he's talking about, less than 1% of all textual variants are both meaningful and viable. Those are the only ones we have to worry about. And so those are the ones that the New King James translators and the New American Standard Bible translators, those are the ones that they disagree on, are these meaningful and viable ones. They're viable because it's a viable option. There's enough evidence. It's either old enough or there's enough copies to where it really might be what the original said. Okay? So there's a debate. Okay, does it mean this? Does it mean that? Or and they're meaningful where they changed the, the actual meaning of the passage has changed. Who cares if a copy changes the meaning of the passage, but it's not viable? Everybody knows. It's only in one copy that's from the 9th or 10th century A.D., so obviously this wasn't in the original. Textual criticism would just toss that one aside. Uh, or if it's a viable option, but it doesn't change the meaning of the passage, who cares? We're still going to translate the passage the same way. So it's got to be both meaningful and viable. That's when it makes the difference. Okay? The, pr the problem here for Bart Ehrman, even the meaningful and viable variants do not call into question any core doctrine of Christianity. So if you've got identical twin brothers, one preaches from the New American Standard Bible, and the other one preaches from the New King James Version, okay? So the New, the, the New American Standard is bracketing out passages that are just in the text of the New King James. They're, they're probably not going to teach any different doctrines, okay? If they're going to literally interpret the Scriptures in its natural, grammatical, historical sense, they're not going to differ on any core doctrine. None of those are called into question. And so basically what I'm saying is everything Bart Ehrman tells us is already in the footnotes of our Bibles. We shouldn't be alarmed. That's what, what textual criticism is. It's the science of studying copies of ancient manuscripts to try to figure out what the originals actually said. It is not an exact science, but in the case of the New Testament, and only in the case of the New Testament, it is as close to an exact science as you can get. Why? Because we got so many copies. Okay? Um, the main meaningful and viable variants, do those last 12 verses of Mark's gospel belong there? Some would say yes, I would say yes, but others would say no. That's a disagreement between New American Standard Bible versus New King James Version. It's not the difference between Christianity and skepticism. Okay? So your pastor may not believe that those verses belong there. I tend to think they do. I think what we fail to do is we fail to realize that sometimes the oldest manuscripts are not best if we can find church fathers uh, quoting, the, like for instance, uh, the second to last verse from Mark's Gospel is quoted in 180 AD by Irenaeus, a bishop in the early church, and he quotes it as being coming from the close of Mark's Gospel. So I think that that, that that should count for more than what a lot of our, our uh, uh, textual critics give it. But whatever the case, wherever you stand on that, what about Jesus? Um, uh, and by the way, what do you lose if you take out those verses? You end up with an empty tomb and an angel saying that Jesus is risen. Go tell his disciples he's going to appear to them. Okay? But even, so even if you take out the appearances that are listed after that and the Great Commission there, those things are still mentioned in the other three Gospels. So we don't lose anything. 
We don't say, well, because that passage is gone, then Jesus didn't rise and didn't appear. That's, that's, that's not, not true. We find it in the other passages. What about John 7, 53 to 8, 11? Uh, Jesus forgiving the woman caught in adultery. New American Standard Bible, NIV, they say that that really isn't in the best manuscripts. What they mean is it's not in the oldest ones. It's in the majority of the manuscripts. I tend to f favor the majority text. I think it became the majority text because they knew they had the best copies. So I think it belongs there. But even if you take it out, is that going to change? Are you going to say, I'm going to stop believing in Jesus? Uh, because his forgiving the woman caught in adultery might not have really happened? Uh, no. It doesn't change any core doctrine of Christianity. Uh, Mark uh, 141. Is it going to destroy your faith if you find out maybe Jesus didn't heal the guy of leprosy because of compassion? Maybe he did it because he was frustrated and angry at the disbelief he was encountering by the people? Um, the, but, the, but that's meaningful and viable. But uh, the fact of the matter doesn't touch on the core. Or in John 1.18, whether Jesus is called God the Son, God the Only Begotten, or whether Jesus is called the Son of God. I don't think it drastically changes our belief. We build the deity of Christ on other passages anyway. Uh, Matthew 24, 36. Do you realize Jesus, in, in that passage, the, the, the manuscripts, uh, the best manuscripts don't say that Jesus said, well, I don't know the day of my, my, oh no, my father, only my father knows the day of my return, the day and the hour of my return, not the angels, but only the father. He doesn't say not even the son in that passage. Does that change anything we thought that, that, that we believe? No, especially since Bart Ehrman never mentions the parallel passage, Mark 13, 31, where Jesus does say, not even the son knows. So basically, if Matthew decided, I'm going to record two-thirds of the phrase, or 80% or of Jesus' statement, I'm going to quote 80% of it, and, um, and Mark says, no, I'm going to quote the whole thing. No contradiction there. No problem there. Um, and then 1 John 5, 7, and 8. Here's, here's what Bart Ehrman does. See, what he's doing is he's, he's messing with your mind because he knows that most Christians haven't studied textual criticism. So this is going to blow us away because we don't know what he knows. So he gives us stuff that only specialists can deal with, and then he walks away and doesn't tell us that it's not as bad as it sounds. Uh, 1 John 5, 7, and 8, he says, this is the only single passage in the Bible that teaches the Trinity, and it's not in the oldest manuscripts. See, he's, he's implying that if this passage is gone, and some, some you know, probably most Christian New Testament critics think that passage doesn't belong there, okay? But he's implying if that's not there, the whole doctrine of the Trinity is gone. Nobody bases the doctrine of the Trinity on that one passage alone. I'm sure Bart Ehrman has heard about systematic theology, where you take teachings from different passages of Scripture, and you put them together, and you try to systematize them. The Bible teaches there's only one God. Numerous places. The Bible teaches that the Father is called God. It calls the Son God. It calls the Holy Spirit God. And then it says they're three distinct persons. So you put that together, you get the doctrine of the Trinity with or without 1 John 5, 7, and 8. Now, now I know that. If Phil Fernandez knows that, Bart Ehrman knows it. But you can check his scriptural index and in, in misquoting Jesus. He doesn't even refer to Mark 13, 13. Uh, uh, 31 on the earlier thing, and, uh, and he doesn't even tell us about the Trinity in 1 John 5, 7. Eight. So in other words, he's with, withholding information that resolves uh, these issues. So when everything's said and done, uh, the only reason why there's so many variants is because there's so many copies, okay? If you're going to get 26,000 copies, you're going to get a lot of variants. But when most of them are spelling errors or the movable new or the word order, when everything is said and done, the only meaningful and viable variance uh, does not change our, our faith one iota. And he, these guys always want to talk about, what about this possible discrepancy and this possible, was it one angel at the tomb? Was it two angels at the tomb? Or were they two men? And blah, blah. Why, when, when are they going to ever talk about what they have in common? They all say, look, he was crucified, he died, he was buried, he rose from the dead on the third day, he appeared numerous times, and then he ascended to heaven. Okay? 
it's what they have in common that really makes it obvious that there is strong historical evidence. You know, I, I, I get sick and tired of hearing historians say that the crucif Jesus' death by crucifixion is one of the most firmly established historical facts from ancient history. I get tired of, of hearing that because the same data that deals with his death also deals with his resurrection. So they should also say one of the most firmly established historical facts of ancient history is the bodily resurrection and appearances of Jesus of Nazareth. The reason why they don't say it is because a lot of them have um, a bias against miracles, a philosophical bias against miracles that they smuggle in to their historical research so they just dismiss good historical data because based on their philosophy, they don't want to go there. Um, Leading scholars of the New Testament text, Westcott and Hort, back in the late 1800s, said when you just deal, just dealing with the meaningful and viable variants, the New Testament is 98.6% accurate. Bruce Metzger, 100 years later, Bart Ehrman's mentor, says uh, now with more manuscripts, with more textual criticism, with more studies, he said it was 99.5% accurate. Second place of all ancient literature, Homo's Iliad at 95%. 99.5% sounds a lot like 95%, but it's really not. When you deal with textual criticism, what this means is only five words out of every 1,000 are called into question, and a lot of times it, it doesn't even change the meaning of the passage. Okay? With uh, Homer's Iliad, it's 50 words out of every 1,000 are called into question. Ten, so in other words, the New Testament is 10 times more accurate, its manuscripts than second place, Homer's Iliad. Uh, basically, if you want to be as strict as Bart Ehrman is, wants us to be with the New Testament text, we would reject everything um, from the first few centuries AD and before. Then Elaine Pagels, another Princeton scholar, she claims that the original Christianity was not the Christianity we find today. There was no unified belief system. So the New Testament should contain the Gnostic writings as well as the books already in the canon. So in other words, She's saying, you know, she's a postmodernist and she's all trying to slam all these power, all these people who want power. And she said, look, the early church had all this power. If they had all this power, I don't know why they had to flee all the time and, and uh, why these guys died by crucifixion and being stoned to death and stuff. But whatever the case, they had all this political power and so they forced their views and they burned everybody. They burned all the uh, other writings and stuff and it's like, where's the evidence of this? Well, it was burned. Um, uh, okay, uh, but whatever the case, she claims the Gnostics have as much right to claim to be original Christianity as uh, the New Testament writings. Well, what were the tests of canonization for the early church? Well, number one, was it written by an apostle or at least somebody who was a colleague of an apostle so that it had apostolic authority? Number two, is it edifying or profitable for the entire church? You know, Paul wrote, well, maybe I shouldn't do that with the camera, but Paul wrote at least one, possibly two more letters to the Corinthians, and it's not in our Bible. So apparently the Corinthians received it and said, whoa, this is not profitable for the entire church. And we, with the Corinthians, you can, you can let your mind wander what those problems might. He might be naming names about some of their sinful lifestyles. So he said, get everybody in on Sunday. We're going to read this letter from the, from the pulpit and then we're either going to burn it or hide it, but do not make copies and do not send them to other churches. With, with what we call 1st and 2nd Corinthians, they said, this is pro as, as much as this makes us look like uh, idiots, um, let's make copies and send them to the other churches because the Holy Spirit is not just speaking to us, he's speaking to the entire church. See, if, God if God's going to go through all the trouble of guiding human authors to record his word without error, then the Holy Spirit is also going to go through all the trouble making sure the early church recognizes which books belong in that Bible. Um, and so, whatever the case, uh, is it edifying and profitable for the entire church? And number three, is it in agreement with previous revelation? The Old Testament and the portion of the New Testament are already written at that point. Okay? And now the Gnostic writings failed all of those tests. Okay? Uh, what happens is we Christians argue for what I call canonization by subtraction. That's where the church councils from 170 A.D. to 370 A.D. debated which books belong in there. 
But at that point, they already knew the Gospel of Thomas shouldn't be there. So they were trying to subtract the bogus books. And uh, they got overly zealous, and then they started saying, well, wait a minute, the book of Revelation doesn't sound like anything else in the New Testament, of course, because it's about the end times. Uh, so maybe we ought to get rid of that. And so there's a debate about that. And then James, how do you reconcile James chapter 2 with uh, Romans chapter 4 and Paul's doctrine of justification by faith alone? You know, how do we wrestle with that? So maybe we ought to throw James out the window. And we don't even know who wrote Hebrews. Maybe we ought to trash that. So basically, they were throwing out the bad books, but they were actually thinking about throwing out some of the good books. But when you look at canonization by addition, that's as soon as the letters are received, the churches realize, hey, this is edifying for the entire church. It's not heretical material. It comes from an apostolic authority. Let's make copies and, and send them out. All you got to do is take three apostolic fathers. By 110 AD, Ignatius, Bishop of Antioch, Clement of Rome, Bishop of Rome, and uh, Polycarp, Paul's, I mean, uh, John's pupil, who was the Bishop of Smyrna, just those, those three guys alone, their writings, and you, are, you, are, you have quoted or alluded to 25 out of the 27 New Testament books that we have today, and they allude to them as authoritative or quote them as authoritative writings. Uh, in other words, there was no question in the minds of the, of the bishops of the big cities which books belonged in the Bible by the close of the first century A.D. The questions crept up, crept into the picture when all of a sudden in, you know, 160 A.D., some pastor in a not-so-big of a city, pastor in a church, he doesn't have, you know, he's only got like, you know, half of the Gospels and half of Paul's writings and half of the book of Revelation, and then somebody brings the Gospel of Thomas, so he starts preaching from that from his pulpit. And then everybody's scratching their head, what is he doing? So then you got to start going into canonization by subtraction. But I think we need to put more emphasis on canonization by addition. I know, you know, there's other evidence. There's evidence in the Bible that books were already, New Testament books were already accepted as Scripture before even the, the New Testament was completed. Paul in 1 uh, Timothy chapter 5 quotes from Luke's gospel, a passage that's only in Luke and calls it scripture. Okay? Uh, and, and, and by the way, if somebody doesn't want to accept 1 Timothy, if the liberal critics want to say, I don't accept it as Pauline, fine. Marcus Borg still dates it as a first century document. So in the first century, leaders in the early church considered Luke's gospel to be scripture. 2 Peter chapter 3, and again, the liberal critics don't want to accept that as authentic, but they still acknowledge it was written by, at the latest, 110 A.D. And uh, the author of uh, 2 Peter, I think, it's, I think I'm really convinced it's Peter, uh, but even if you don't accept that, the author is already referring to Paul's writings as Scripture. Okay? So we can't bypass canonization by addition. Um, you realize you could trace all the New Testament books back to Jesus's inner circle? Because Matthew was one of the apostles. He wrote Matthew. And by, by the way, you know, a lot of, a lot of New Testament critics that, that I dialogue with and stuff like that, they'll say, oh, you don't still believe that, do you? And I ask, okay, well, well, why did the early church make that up? Why in the world would you make up, yeah, Matthew wrote this gospel, now, now read it and accept Jesus as your Messiah. Wait, who's Matthew? Wasn't he the guy who was a tax collector who collected taxes from the Jews for the Romans and then ripped us off in the process? Um, that's horrible public relations. The only reason why the early church would teach that Matthew wrote Matthew would be if Matthew wrote Matthew. Uh, <laughs> by the way, all the early church fathers that mention the authors, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, okay? Um, not every early church father mentioned the authors, but the ones who did was Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Um, Peter, uh, if we accept the traditional, what the early church father, I am not that impressed by New Testament scholarship uh, as, as much as I'm impressed by what the early church fathers said. Okay? And the early church fathers believe Peter wrote First and Second Peter. Papias, um, writing about uh, 110 AD, tells us that Mark got his gospel from Peter's preaching. 
So that was uh, Peter's preaching in Rome. And so First and Second Peter and Mark are uh, Peter's under his authority. Paul wrote his 13 letters. Luke and Acts were written by Luke, both written to um, Theophilus. Acts is the sequel of Luke. It ends abruptly in 61 AD. Doesn't mention James's uh, martyrdom 62 AD. Peter or Paul's martyrdom 64 to 67 AD. Doesn't mention the destruction of the temple 70 AD. Why not? It just ends anticlimactically with Paul in Rome in 61 AD. It makes no sense unless Luke wrote right up to the present day. So Luke wrote Acts 61 AD. It's the, se- uh, it's the sequel of Luke's gospel, which had to be written earlier. Uh, but Luke was a colleague of Paul. I, th- I actually think Paul commissioned Luke to write the gospel, and that's why in the epistles Paul doesn't spend a lot of time talking about the gospel because he knew they already had knowledge either from oral, the oral teachings of Paul and others or from reading Luke's gospel or another gospel. And the author of Hebrews was not Paul. The author of Hebrews said he never met Jesus face to face. But people who did meet Jesus preached to him and the Holy Spirit uh, confirmed it with signs and wonders. And, uh, uh, but he knows Timothy. And his doctrine is clearly Pauline doctrine. And so I think he was in Paul's uh, family as well uh, under his authority. Uh, John wrote the Gospel of John, the three letters, and the book of Revelation. James wrote the epistle of James. He was the half-brother of Jesus. His younger brother, Jude, probably followed in his footsteps under his authority as the, the leader of the Jerusalem church after James died. So, I mean, you could bring it all down to five guys. Matthew, you could even argue, did it under either James or Peter's authority while in the Jerusalem church. So you could, you could actually knock it down to, to Peter, Paul, John, and James. And guess what Paul calls Peter, John, and James? He calls them the pillars of the Jerusalem church. Now, if the New Testament, Marcus Borg is here, he's going to say, yeah, but I don't accept all of the, the uh, you know, I'm an Oregon State University professor. I don't accept the traditional authors. He had his chance to debate me. He didn't just didn't say yes, didn't say no, and I went unopposed, speak on the resurrection. My response to Marcus Borg would have been, I don't care if you don't accept them. You're coming on a scene 2,000 years later with wild speculation trying to wipe out what the early church fathers would have known and what the early church fathers told us. We, sometimes we just get too intimidated, just like with evolutionary science. Because brilliant guys use big words we don't understand, we think they must be right. Nah. It's for me and my house, I'm going to stick with Ignatius and uh, Clement, Clement of Rome, Clement Alexandria, Origen, um, you have Ignatius, you have Tertullian, you have all these early church fathers. Just within uh, 100 or 200 years of the fact, they should have known. And they told us, and lo and behold, it's the ones we have today. Um, the Gnostic writings failed all three tests. They were written too late to be apostolic. The fir- earliest one, Gospel of Thomas, 140 AD, that's 110 years after Jesus walked the earth. They were not considered uh, profitable because they were, number three, heretical. Contradicted Christian teaching. and They even rejected the entire Old Testament. The Gnostics were false teachers. And everybody admits, even Elaine Pagels admits, they were plagiarists. So when the Gospel of Thomas starts out, these are the secret teachings that Jesus gave to Thomas. She doesn't believe that. She believes that whoever's writing that is lying. So if the guy's lying about who, who he really is, why should we believe him on anything else? But whatever the case, it's the, the Gnostic teachings that Jesus only pretended to be human and wasn't really human, and the Old Testament was written by an evil God, the New Testament God is a different God, uh, there's good reasons why the early church rejected these writings. They were far too late, they had no apostolic authority, and they were heretical. It taught a totally different religion. Uh, the not, so then there's... Just the Gnostic teachings contradict the Bible. Old Testament creator God is evil. They taught the flesh is totally evil. The spirit is totally good. We don't believe it because the, the, the flesh is redeemable. God's going to redeem this planet. Um, the spirit is not totally good. Fallen angels and Satan are evil. Uh, Jesus only appeared to be a man according to these guys. He didn't really become a man. No real crucifixion of Jesus. And salvation is not by God's grace alone through faith alone and Jesus alone. 
Salvation is through secret knowledge. And then finally, Robert Price, I got the dialogue with him on the infidel radio guy show or whatever, Reggie Finley. Uh, I don't even know if it was profitable to listen to because I didn't get equal time because the host was an atheist and he, every time I wanted to respond to Robert Price, he had his own questions. And Reggie Finley's questions are not on the level of Robert Price. Robert Price is brilliant, but nobody agrees with him. I, I refer to him as the apostle of denial. He got really offended. I didn't mean to offend him. I didn't, but, um, but we'll talk a little bit about him. But he believes the early church borrowed ideas from pagan myths and that Jesus never really existed. He was merely a myth. Okay, well, in response to that, this is a revival of the discredited Christ myth theory of the 19th century, uh, uh, F.C. Bauer of 1870s. Uh, Price wants us to ignore 150 years of progress in, in critical studies that has proven a large portion of the New Testament to be historical, even when you start out as a skeptic examining these things. He assumes without evidence that miracles are impossible, so automatically he's going to deny the incarnation, the resurrection, and Jesus' miracles. Uh, the early church was rooted in Judaism. Gentile influence was minimal. I mean, if they didn't care, it's like, oh, yeah, let's just take myths. Oh, yeah, let's just take gods from here and there. We're pre-scientific. We're, um, we're gullible. If they did that, nobody would have put them to death. They were, the early church was not, they were not being executed because they said Jesus is Lord. They were being executed because they said Jesus is Lord, period. The Romans never met a God they didn't like. They had no problem if, if, if one group of Jews who called themselves Christians added one more God to the pantheon, as long as you say Caesar is Lord. But the Christians said, we can't say Caesar is Lord, Jesus is Lord. And Jesus is Lord alone. And uh, so the idea that they're just borrowing left and right from pagan myths, uh, no, these guys are being thrown to wild beast. These guys are being burned alive. These guys are being crucified. It's not because they were uh, wimps and it's like, oh, yeah, I agree with everything, man. No, they took a stand for something. They took a stand for the, the teachings that they gave to us, and they were willing to suffer and die for that. Uh, the mystery religions, dying gods who came back to life, Christian thinker J.P. Moreland, his work, Scaling the Secular City, uh, shows that these were never intended to be historical. When you write mythology, and even C.S. Lewis recognized that. He was an expert in classical literature, and when he became a Christian, it shocked him that he continually told himself that the New Testament was mythology. Look, if it's mythology, you don't, you don't mention the name of the current emperor and the current governor, and that a census has taken place. You don't give eyewitness details when you're telling myth, uh, making myths. Never intended to, the myths were never intended to be historical. They were associated with yearly vegetation cycles. The similarities with Jesus are only apparent, not real. What makes, what makes the similarities sound real is the anti-Christian will take Christian terminology like born again, resurrection, new life, savior, whatever. They'll take Christian terms and retell the pagan story with all the Christian terminology. Oh yeah, then it sounds like there's parallels. But you read those writings as they're originally written, the similarities are only apparent, not real. The myths were polytheistic, believed in many gods. They were syncretistic, they blended other religions, and there's no real moral context. It's the exact opposite when it comes uh, to the New Testament. And then you have no real full-blown resurrection before 100 AD. In other words, we do find ancient gods being resurrected in mythology but we find no evidence of them being resurrected until Christianity is established in the Roman Empire, okay? Uh, so the real parallels date after Christianity, so barring occurred, it was the pagans that borrowed from Christianity. Uh, Martin Hengel, uh, one of the world's greatest New Testament scholars, shows that first century Palestinian Jews rejected pagan beliefs and practices. They were very exclusive in their faith, and that's where the early church grew out of. The existence of synagogues throughout first century Israel showed that the ancient Jews were educated enough to read. Many of them actually could even read Hebrew. Um, and that Jesus was a real historical, a recent historical person. There's excellent historical evidence for his life and works. The creed listing his post-resurrection appearances is a creed from the early 30s AD. Gerd Ludmann, Marcus Borg, 
who are not traditional Christians, okay, the Jesus leaders of the Jesus Seminar, they date that creed to 31 A.D. with Jesus' crucifixion being 30 A.D. This is not legendary stuff that took uh, decades. In fact, even Robert Price knows enough to know he believes Jesus was a legend. He didn't really exist, but he believes it was a legend that was formed between 30 A.D. and before Paul started writing in 50 A.D. So the guys who were supposed to know this Jesus who supposedly lived were still alive, and, and Paul and these other guys are either writing mythology or believing fairy tales just within 20 years? Uh, I don't think so. When you factor in the ancient creeds, he, used to, he debated Gary Habermas and Mike Lacona one year. He, de, he dialogued with me the next year. When he dialogued with them, he, he acknowledged the Pauline authorship of 1 Corinthians. He did so poorly in that dialogue that by the time he dialogued with me one year later, he de, then believed that, uh, uh, denied that Paul wrote anything in the New Testament. So uh, Robert Price does what I would do if I were a non-Christian. I would deny everything. Okay, uh, honestly, I would deny everything, and I would make the Christian prove everything, and then I, I was going to say I would hope and pray, but I wouldn't hope and pray. But, but I would I would hope that eventually I would die someday without ever having somebody provided a big strong strong case for me, so I could just just keep pushing it off, just keep asking questions, just keep denying everything, and if they answer something, then go back to it later on the next day. And that's pretty much what Robert Price is doing. Uh, dying and rising gods, uh, Adonis, there's no death or resurrection until after Jesus. Addis, there's a death but no birth, not a deity. Osiris is murdered, dismembered, chopped up into 14 pieces. 13 of the 14 pieces are, are uh, put back together, reassembled, and then he becomes a powerful god in the underworld. So Mike Lacona says that's a zomb zombification, that's not a resurrection. Uh, Tammuz's recent find of Sumerian text shows no resurrection or rebirth in the documents that precede Christianity. Baal, Isis, Dionysius also fails dying and rising gods. You want to refute Robert Price by Gregory Boyd and Paul Eddy, Gregory Boyd and Paul Eddy, The Jesus Legend. Buy that book. It's not an easy read, but it's, it's worth it. The Jesus Legend by Paul Eddy and Gregory Boyd. Um, legend creating... Movements, uh, this is because he's been so backed into, into the corner that Price has to find guys who legends were developed about them within 100 years of their death, okay? So he turns to Apollonius of Tyana, who died 96 to 98 A.D. But this was written 100 years, when it was written, was like about you know, 180, 190 A.D., written 100 years after the Gospels, more than 100 years after the Gospels, May have, may have really copied the Gospels. The empress at that time uh, was opposed to Christianity and, uh, and paid a guy, I believe it was uh, Philostratus, to write about Apollonius. So he's basically being paid to make Apollonius look as good as Jesus to compete with Christianity. Yet there's, no, not, there's not even any resurrection appearances in there anyway. Okay? Uh, Sabbatai Savi, this guy failed as a messiah. I think he lived in medieval times. He was possibly mentally ill. There's no reports of seeing him after his death. The Muslims forced him to convert to Islam. They threatened his life, so he converted to Islam. And then he told the people, I'm not the Messiah, convert to Islam. And uh, then after he died, his, his right-hand man, his John the Baptist guy, said he's going to come back, but he never did. Okay? Uh, and supposedly, you know, somebody had a dream that he was alive or something. Wow, that sounds a lot like the Gospels, doesn't it? No, it, it doesn't. And then Simon Kimbangu, I don't know what to think about him. Supposedly he was a Congo miracle worker. He's got millions of followers in Africa today. He died in prison. He was imprisoned by the communists for preaching the Gospel. The communists don't like the Gospel. He died in prison in 1951. I don't know. He, he, at worst, this guy was like a Benny Hinn type whose miracles probably aren't real miracles. Okay, or if we do more research and find out they're legitimate miracles, uh, we may have to think outside the box a little bit and be open to the possibility that maybe our God and Savior decided to send um, a modern-day Christian prophet 
uh, to Africa. Simon Kimbangu never claimed to be God, never claimed to be Messiah, and claimed that the miracles he did was through the power of Jesus. Only some of his heretical f followers uh, deified him after his death and, and tried to teach um, that he was God. So I don't know about Simon Kimbangu exactly, but we need more research uh, 